Mature and graphic subject matters discussed, 18 plus only, viewer discretion advised. Very cheerful adult content, not for unaccompanied youth, but all these things discussed are a good, strong, fresh, honorable, pure blessing for the family. As it says in Nehemiah 8 and 9, when you read the stuff that shows that you've been misbehaving, you should celebrate because at least now you know how you have to change, right? So, in the 1990s, a remarkable thing happened. For the first time in modern scientific history, they charted the actual physical structure of the clitoris in the woman. Now, all people go, oh, man, where is he going with this? Oh, no, rah, 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 rah. Listen, it's fascinating. The clitoris is part of our family body, just like a finger, just like an ear, just like our beautiful eyes. The clitoris is erectile tissue, tissue that gets big, 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 just like the penis, only it's inside. I did not know this. I didn't know this. I knew that there was something that kind of got stiff in the woman place, but I didn't know that there was this huge structure that literally wraps around the vaginal canal. And when it's, when it's aroused and, uh, you know, it's like the man gets a big stiffy on the outside and the woman gets a big stiffy on the inside. And that's cool. I mean, that's kind of fascinating. These are the things that my parents didn't talk about. And here, I'm the guy... Here, check this out. I met my birth dad when I was 40 years old. I discovered that he had been married five times. That kind of weirded me out a little bit. He was married five times. I got invited to a family reunion. It was awesome. I mean, my brothers and sisters look like me, and we all know the same songs. It's really, we sat around singing for two days. It was pretty cool. But when I first got to the place where we were having the family reunion, I learned something. My bro half-brothers and sisters said to me, Listen, our dad is a wonderful guy. But you're so lucky that you, did, you didn't grow up in this family. Because we were dealing with his promiscuity like our whole lives. We got kicked out of two university towns. Because he was fooling around with faculty and students. And there are six or seven other children that showed up as a surprise in these relationships around my father's life, our father's life, and we have no idea how many babies there actually are out there from our dad. So people, I mean, at that family reunion, I met like 10 half-brothers and sisters. And then they told me there's at least six or seven more, and possibly many more than that. And then I heard about his life. He was 16 years old during World War II. His father had died. He would go down to the bay at night and set little fish nets to, just to catch a few fish to make 10 cents to bring home to mom so she could buy some cornmeal and keep food on the table. He was a hard-working young man. And he was told by the other fishermen, look, you know boats really well. You should enlist in the merchant marines. Otherwise, they will draft you. They will put boots on you and a gun in your hand and send you into machine gun fire, and you'll be, t you'll, you'll be killed. 
If you go into the Merchant Marines, you'll work on boats, and you'll already work, learn, know how to work on boats. So my daddy, God bless him, he got on a train to St. Petersburg, Florida, of all places. I lived there. I lived there. I didn't even know that was my daddy's territory. He went to St. Petersburg, Florida, right by the Vinoy Park Hotel, St. Petersburg Bay, by the pier, there was the Merchant Marine Academy. All these people were coming and listing from all over the place. And some amazing things happened to him. He became famous because he knew how to row so well. He became a rowing trainer almost instantly. He didn't even go through basic training. They're like, wow, you row so good. Can you teach these farmers how to handle oars? He's like, well, I guess so. So he's 16 years old. He lied about his age. Then he shipped out, and he was on boats for four years, four years straight. He was on cargo ships going back and forth across the Atlantic and all around the world. And it was horrible. Because his friends on one boat, they both left port, two boats left port, loaded with gear. One of the boats gets torpedoed and sink, sunk. And who gets rescued? Who knows? 10 people? 50 people? It's nasty. And the old sailors would say to him, you remember that port that we were in last year? We're coming into it. But hold on to your socks because the whole town has been flattened by bombs. And so my dad would walk into a town where he had a meal and he had a couple of beers and he went out dancing and he had a nice time and the whole town is just completely ruined. And many of the people are just dead. And so the older sail sailors would say to him, listen, buddy, if you go out with a woman, if you have a couple of drinks and dance and you make out with a woman, Please treat her as if you and she are the only people on the whole earth. Because three days from now, you might be at the bottom of the sea, dead, torpedoed. And three days later, she might be bombed. So give your love with all your love and give your heart. And don't be mean or nasty or pushy, but be filled with love and good cheer and a song and tenderness. Because this war is a terrible thing. So my father drank a lot, but the alcohol didn't affect him very much. And by that experience, he literally had a broken conscience when it came to sexual intimacy. He did. I mean, there was, he was under a spirit. You know, he was under two spirits. Alcohol and cheerful, friendly sexual intimacy. So that was my father. That is my lineage. And I don't know if you know anything about generational lineages and spirits and things like that. But I was born, flesh and blood, seed of an extremely cheerful hearted, extremely promiscuous man who made love and made babies with so many women. I mean, who knows? I might have brothers and sisters in Europe from women that he made out with in, during the war. I don't know. When Jesus comes back, I will be able to see. But I'm not surprised that this man was uncanny at making babies. Because in his lineage, in his heart, he was encouraging, wise, smart, good cheer, great singer, positive person. Unusually positive, bright person that everyone remembers. He has a wing named after him at Appalachian State University, the Dr. Albert Victor Bowden Memorial Economics Wing. 
and when I heard interviews with some of his students, they said this guy was the toughest and most interesting and amazing teacher that we've ever had in our life. The way that he handled information, the way that he pushed you and pressed on you was so good So I learned about my dad after I was 40 years old, and I met him, and he passed away in 2004. My mom, my mother, her mom and dad were great people. But her mom, my grandma, was a little bit... um, fussy and prissy and cold. She's the kind of person that would kind of turn off the love if she didn't like something. It's like, oh, well, she'd kind of get, you know, cold and a spirit of, like, disdain on her. And in a marriage, if people are not following what it says in 1 Corinthians 7, your body is no longer your own but you should give. You should give to the other person whenever they desire the gift of the pleasure. I was like, whoa, God, I knew you were like this, huh? It's like, you know, you can't say, oh, I have a headache. And as a matter of fact, I remember in my own married and intimate life, the times when I actually didn't really feel like it but I was giving because the other person was so turned on, ended up being like probably like the most deeply memorable times because I was giving and I was amazed at how, you know, the other one was enjoying me. (laughs) You know, and that's just a neat thing. It's a reality part of life. You know, it it is appropriate to tell children. It's really interesting because... The man body part and the woman body part are different. But when they're together, you can look in the eyes of your other person and say, okay, I don't really exactly know what your body feels like, but it's so cool to see that you're enjoying me while I'm enjoying you. And it's just like kind of an extra exciting, wonderful unity feeling. And, you know, that's truth. That's reality. So, when you get into a situation where you evaluate all the animals on the earth, do you know that the human beings are the only animals that make intercourse face-to-face, mouth-to-mouth, eye-to-eye? All the other ones go from behind. It's not interesting. So we can like whisper and sing in the Holy Spirit and our sparkly eyes can love each other and we can actually watch the expressions on one another's faces as we're enjoying. And, you know, I also like to mention to the family, look, why do we go to the zoo? We go to the zoo to look at all these interesting different animals. Well, guess what? Pictures of naked people and videos of naked people are kind of fascinating to look at. Especially when a person is really sexually excited. It's pretty interesting to look at. Because you can tell how excited and, and you know, ecstasy feeling the person is. So, if you end up seeing pictures or videos of naked people enjoying each other, don't be surprised if you're really motivated to look because it's fascinating. And since I was never given that moment, just that little touch of conversation, some of these little tiny touches of conversation is all I needed to be able to start to flow with my parents about my own experiences and say, Oh, okay, Mom, I got it. Like, I'm starting to feeling feel all that, you know, body feel-good stuff. 
I understand now. I'm asking God to keep me self-controlled. <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, it's just a, it's a small part of life, but it's a powerful part. You know, it's like a little drop of dynamite. <laughs> That's what sex and reproduction is. So my mom, my mom has a mother and a father, and my, her mother and father and my grandparents are great people. But my grandmother's a little bit cold, and after I really started to understand relationships and things, when I meditated on my grandmother and grandfather, I realized that she was a little bit cold to the husband advances. I just knew that in my spirit. And not as any sort of excuse, but in reality, there was a tragic thing in my mother's life. There was a measure of exposure and incest in her life. And she grew up, my mom grew up in a beach town, Ocean City, New Jersey, and with a white bathing suit on, she looked just like Elizabeth Taylor in 1954. And so all the kids in the high school that lived on the beach were like, in the summertime, thousands of people would flood to the island and they would want to hang out with a beach boy or a beach girl. So there was a lot of, you know, making out and sex under the boardwalk and all this other kind of stuff. And when I was 25 years old, my mom broke down in tears and she told me I was with 120 different guys before I got pregnant with you at Duke College of Nursing in North Carolina when I was 23 years old. So mom got pregnant with me at 23 and she had been with 120 different guys by the time she was 23. So I come from my physical body, my seed and the womb were both very promiscuous and quite cheerful in the midst of it even though that's a tragedy it's a you know it's a blending of good and evil it's a tragic thing so um, since when I was a little child and I was growing up I was adopted in the womb my mom admitted to a fellow in New Jersey that she had actually been intimate with who was not the father because he was in a different state when she got pregnant she told me I don't know you who your father is because I was with three different guys in a very short period of time when I was trying to pass my nursing boards it was a nervous time and um, when I came home to New Jersey this one guy who was about to go to Lutheran seminary was like the only person that she admitted to that she was pregnant and he said let's start a family so I little me in my mommy I was at the wedding five months along I was adopted in the womb I was raised by a daddy and then when I was 25 years old my mom <laughs> She could tell I was going through a lot of relationship stuff. And she said, listen, I need to tell you about my life and your life and everything. And so she told me this whole story. And um, I just felt sad for my parents. I was like, why did you wait for so long? You guys are like the favorite parents in the neighborhood. And you take all the kids canoeing and everybody says to me, you better be nice to your parents because they've been so nice to all of us kids. So... They were understood. I mean, the voice of the community is, you know, Steve and David, your parents are great parents. But, so rewind, there's little me. I'm born. I'm going through a handful of years. Around me, there are these powerful promiscuity spirits. Nobody's prayed about this lineage. Nobody's discerning spirits. Nobody's aware of this stuff. So, like, it's present. I mean, I didn't know about that. And so my mom 
was cheerfully promiscuous and my birth dad was cheerfully promiscuous and through interacting with some friends in my neighborhood I was invited into cheerful promiscuity an oral sharing of pleasure and it felt so good and so comfortable comforting and so wonderful and we would hide away and share and of course it's not something we're going to announce to our parents but we had discovered a thing that our parents had never talked about and never brought up as an issue like a fun issue to talk about and when issues are not fun issues if when issues are like weird uncomfortable issues you don't want to go towards those issues anyway so in in God, you rejoice in all things. I'm like, hi, I have a body and it feels really good sometimes. And it's part of the marriage bed and it's why people get married. But since I'm not married right now, my body still feels good sometimes. Hi, God, thank you for how wonderful this God, this body feels. Help me be self-controlled. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff could have been trained to me. So I was about six years old. I was introduced to stimulation and arousal and gosh it was wonderful and it is a thing that I was basically kind of obsessed with for many 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 years when I was 36 years old I discovered the teachings of a very kind kind of fatherly person who had the courage to talk openly about arousal and self-control and the idea that a man should actually learn even in his boyhood how to make his big stiffy penis get quiet and learn like a power of self-control like just calming down and if you learn that power of self-control and that calming down when you have a woman to be with she is going to have more pleasure because you're not going to release. You're going to give and give and give and calm down a little bit and then rise up again and calm down a little bit. And the pleasure of the two of you together will be much better. But the most important thing is, as a boy, you learn how to say no to your physiological urge. Uh, I love that saying that says, a sailboat is not designed to be tied up to a dock and just sit in the water. It is designed to handle a storm and heavy winds. So the best test of life is actually to put it into a testing situation. So in this training that I got from this certain person, um, it was like this invitation to become aroused, but to stop. And not to go past the point of no return. And it was very interesting. And it took a lot of focus. It literally took it. I mean, it was like, it's like working out. It's like utilizing my body, learning how to handle it. And I was almost in tears. I mean, I was like, I wish I knew this when I was like 15 or 17. Like, how come I was so ignorant for so long? I had had a failed marriage. You know, imagine you're a male human being and you're first learning how to handle your body in a way that's like good and strong and excellent and noble. I mean, and it's really cool. It's kind of like when you learn how to say no to that excitement, you become a more powerful person. You can say no to almost anything. You actually have the ability to be better as a person. And it's not just for men, it's for women. The same training is for women, but since the woman is much more internal, it's actually easier for her to calm down. You know, her body doesn't like stand up and say, hi, pay attention to me, <laughs> as much as the man does. So, I mean, that's just our physical reality but for me 
learning about arousal at six years old, and then going through like 30 years of ignorance about what I could have known was a tragedy. Now, check this out. Here's 33, uh, 36, actually, 36. When I was 37, God crashed in on me. God just like moved in on me through an eloquent teaching. It basically describes, look, it seems like there's only one human being in all history that has two to three hundred predictions stretched across writings that were written across a thousand years by 40 people that did not know each other, all coming true in one person. This sounds impossible, but if this person really did live and had all these supernatural powers and resurrected from the dead and people saw him go back into the spirit realm, then he is the only trustworthy spirit guide and you should start speaking to him or through him to the creator God. You say, I am the mediator between you and the Most High God. I am the visitor, the supernatural visitor to the human realm. I am God in human form. And like this eloquent teaching showed the proofs that Jesus is God. And no one in church, when I was growing up, I quit when I was 14. No one gave me those proofs. So, one, I learned how to be self-controlled as a male human being, and my mind was more open to higher things because I wasn't just operating on the who, how are we going to get our next arousal that kind of thing so male self-control then bam connection with God that is my testimony and it's a little difficult to talk about but I feel like it's a very powerful thing in this time because if I can be friendly in this kind of conversation then you know I'm talking to the single moms then your boy or your girl can say, Mommy, I'm kind of like feeling the feel-good sort of too much. Can you pray over me? Like that kind of thing. And as well as that, your children have these devices. And, I mean, it is possible for you to connect into other people's rooms and, you know, do naked pictures and videos whenever the heck you want to do. And that's almost an irresistible thing. I mean, you literally have to face the fact that that is a thing that, that, that's, you know, hard for a human being to resist because it's so fascinating. It's so interesting. So, I am surrounded by single moms. So, therefore, communion group. So I touched on these things. Communion group. When we come together in communion, we have a cluster of families and we know each other. And we have shared our hearts. We know one another's goals and hopes and dreams. We know one another's tragedies and weak areas. We we'll even know a couple areas where there's still trouble spirits that kind of mess with us when we're the most stressed. And we're looking out for each other in those areas. We get more care than the people in the world. When we come together in communion, in the time of our greatest intimacy, we close the doors, lock the doors. We admit our faults, but most of all, we, it, we talk about the things that God is asking us to do that we're avoiding or chickening out on because we need one another's faith to walk on water. And I've developed this thing called the Daddy List which is a whole list of things that we cover from time to time, maybe once a month. All right, let's remember all the ways that human beings are stupid. We stay bitter and angry at people, and we want to go punch them in the nose. We want to go slap them. Um, we're too lazy. We're not taking care of things that we're responsible to take care of. We got too much, too much stuff, too much excess, we're distracted by entertainments and pleasures. In Mark 4.19, the three weeds are what? Fears about the future, a focus on money, and a chasing after pleasant things rather than excellent things. 
an excellent thing can be pleasant in that it's leading you to something awesome, a success. But if you're chasing merely pleasant things, you actually may be losing your excellence and your success. So the three weeds that mess you up and prevent you from reproducing are fears about the future, a focus on money and material things. Well, I don't have to have enough to like, well, what do I do if I quit my job? And can God provide? And then lastly, a chasing after the pleasant. So, be aware and beware. Because when we come together before communion, we're going to check in. And we're literally going to accuse ourselves of being too lazy, spending money inappropriately, you know, anything. So that our, our friends can feel the way that Satan has been attacking us. And they can care for us and pray for us and love us. And so the daddy list is just a list of all the ways that, the way that we're weak or stupid. And one of the things that I, the Holy Spirit's put on my heart is like, okay, if anybody's kind of having arousal problems, if your body's going a little crazy and it wants you to pay attention to it too much, just put your hand up and we'll pray. This is ordinary stuff. There's spirit, spirits all around and we're surrounded by people that are, you know, high on sex and advertising and, you know, everything all around us is full of, you know, sexy enticement. So don't be surprised if you got a little bit of arousal problem. Um, and also, if you're having fantasies in the mind, if your mind is getting stuck on thinking about a certain per person or like that kind of stuff, put your hand up and we'll pray for you. And if you feel bitter or angry or revengeful towards any person, then you're going to have to actually speak that person's name out and we might have to you know, go and help you reconcile with them. So that's a key point. That pretty much wraps it up. I am so sad that the elders in my life, I mean all the elders, including Oswald Chambers and Derek Prince and Bill Johnson and Heidi and Roland Baker and D.L. Moody. I have never repetitively heard from any of my favorite teachers, go home and have honesty times with your family with communion. That is the church. And in that intimate honesty and communion time, that's when the Holy Spirit will speak to you the most cleanly. If you're prophesying, Father showed me that if you're prophesying with a microphone, just the amplification of your voice and the fact that you're, you know, making a big, big, big thing, that can actually be used by the darkness because the darkness is the opposite of humility. And prophetic words are much better and more powerful in the home. In the big box church setting, yes, it is appropriate to pray over people and to prophesy for them. But in your intimate family group, your family unity group, in that group, that, that is where you're really going to get cared for by the Holy Spirit in a most majestic way. Come on. I am surrounded by single moms and I'm going to help you make a flyer and go out there and find families and brothers to come together that are willing to, to, to go through the list of all the things that Jesus taught, including no emotional political involvement, no military service, extreme caution about remarriage. One marriage vow for life is what Jesus taught clearly for 300 years. You read the writings about the early Christians. It constantly, and you know, and our master said that a man whose wife is still living, if she desires another wife, she commits, he, he does not make a marriage, but rather commits adultery. You know, I mean, it's just like they understood what he said and they held on to it. 
And, uh, I mean, I can't afford to play games. I'm not into this Christianity stuff because I liked it. I don't like Christianity because it's so messed up. But if I'm going to do this disciple of Jesus thing, I want all the goodies. And also, I'm going to bring in elements of my favorite ministries. I mean, Paul said, I prefer to build on nobody else's foundation. But I have learned really neat things that you can actually just go see on the internet. I was like, whoa, I get it. Let's go out and do that. Whoa, I get it. I never saw that point in the Bible before. Let me look at it again. I mean, there's so many ways of accessing good, friendly, loving disciples showing how to live the book of Acts. Not just to study scripture, but to live the book of Acts. There's a big difference Sitting around and having nice Bible studies and prayer meetings is not living the book of Acts. And it starts out with male and female human beings. And it starts out with sent ones who are sheltering and gathering together little clusters of family communion groups. Acts 14. Paul and Barnabas are traveling around and they're hated and they're almost killed. And they're accepted and people are coming into the Lord and many are being baptized. So in some places they're hated, in some places they're accepted, but they are planting little house churches here and there and here. And then they go back through the house churches and they sit down with the people and say, okay, now, Holy Spirit, which person among these people is the sweetest, kindest elder who can be the mediator and the one who is the voice of heaven if there's a conflict? And that's how the pastor was revealed. The pastor was not hired from a seminary or brought in from somewhere else. I mean, a corrective teacher and guide could come in, but the point is a pastor is just a local elder person who sits and listens to the troubles of the people as they share their hearts before prayer, before worship, before communion. Sharing the heart before prayer, before worship, before communion is an absolute first priority. If you have not been doing that, you are not yet the church of Jesus Christ. Let's say that together. If we are not meeting in our homes, if we are not meeting in our homes, and admitting our callings from God and our faults and sharing our hearts together before prayer, then we are not yet the church of Jesus Christ. We must meet in our homes as well as other places. They met from house to house and in public places. If we are not meeting in our homes for an intimate, closed family communion group, we are not yet the Church of Jesus Christ.